open, you know, for a lot of discussion and a lot of, uh, of thought that is actually paving the way into other conservation topics. Uh, the reason I am today talking about wetlands and not about other topics that I have, this is possibly my fourth trophy launch in 20 year periods, so sorry. <laughs> it's not bad. But uh, yes, um, this topic of wetlands uh, has become of a major interest for me since I became the director of uh, the CREO, which is one of four uh, Ramsar regional centers in the world. I'm going to talk uh, first about CREO, and then I'm going to talk about the specific cases I would like to share with you. So I guess um, to make it... Um, you can use this uh -huh. one. This or one here? Okay, good. Yes. So maybe, uh -huh. Oh, that should be... Or do you tap it or... I think it will be easy if you, if you want to go. This one here, okay, no problem. Okay. Yes. yes, good. Research and training on wetlands in the Americas. The creation of CREO actually is, uh, the legal creation is actually before uh, what we consider our anniversary. We have our offices located, one has come to be known as a city of knowledge in Panama City, uh, a former U.S. Army base that has been converted into more of the research and knowledge uh, management uh, area. And uh, in 1999, in the Conference of the Parties of San Jose, Costa Rica, uh, the, uh, the Ramsar Convention approved the creation of what was the first regional center in the world and the first of the regional initiatives. Uh, it took a few years to actually uh, uh, get it rolling. Um, and in five years later, in 2004, uh, the government of Panama passed the law for CREO to start. Now, the Ramsar Convention, uh, you've heard about it, is also the first of the global environmental agreements. And that's actually remarkable. Remember, a lot of the agreements began to develop after the 1972 conference, uh, but Ramsar was already uh, a way, way underway. And they... Uh, usually refer to it as the only worldwide agreement focusing on one ecosystem. I would actually call it different. It's actually different ecosystems, but I think it's mostly the idea that it's ecosystem-based as opposed to other kind of, uh, of approach. I also think it was very interesting, uh, its origin, uh, because uh, it was developed mostly as a Asian, uh, a African, European partnership and it, had, it was very much related with the migration of, of birds, you know, among different sites. That's why they needed a treaty that would allow them to uh, work together. Uh, as part of this uh, conception of this new international regime, they created uh, the concept of wetlands of international importance, which the world has come to call Ramsar sites as a way to make it shorter, or basically designate uh, some places in the different countries that are very important for the conservation of wildlife and for the protection of wetlands. But in the same treaty in which they talk about Ramsar sites, they also introduced uh, that fascinating concept of the wise use of wetlands, of all wetlands, not only of Ramsar sites, and also they emphasize transboundary cooperation, as I told you before, since they're trying to make all these countries work together. Now it has become really large. We're talking about 170 countries around the world. Uh, 2,341 uh, Ramsar sites, I think that's the latest count. There are many Ramsar sites that are created every year, and uh, we believe we got, you know, the latest number after several of them were created in Africa, you know, the, the past week. Um, when you add up all those Ramsar sites, then you get uh, 250,479,417 hectares, which is uh, slightly close to Mexico, the surface of Mexico. So it's, it's a lot of area, especially for wetlands, which are, in general, uh, ecosystems that do not cover as much uh, area in, in, in the entire world. Now, um, how do you define wetlands? I'm going to try to go quickly on this because this is, you know, a very, very um, complicated in many ways. Uh, for the convention, they say, uh, they talk about areas of marsh, fen, peatland, or water, whether natural or artificial. That's an interesting uh, detail, permanent or temporary, so that it allows for flotations, with water that is static or flowing, fresh, brackish, or salt, including areas of marine water, the depth of which at low tide does not exceed six meters. 
this is extremely broad as a definition. As uh, you will see, actually, uh, what may be considered a wetland of international importance is very broad. We have rivers and lakes, of course. We have coastal areas of different sorts. We are in Florida, so we are very familiar with all the different variations of coastal areas. Mangroves and coral reefs, no interest in coral reefs will be considered wetlands of international importance. Uh, sorry, wetlands in general, but they can be rancher sites, pit bogs, what we call the Spanish turberas, and also artificial lagoons could be considered you know, under certain circumstances. The scope of CREO, because we are the Ramsar family, which is possibly the best way to call it, is very large. And he has many uncles, aunts, uh, siblings. So uh, Credo is part of that Ramsar family. And we are one of four regional centers. Here you can see the location of the different uh, regional centers uh, in Korea, Iran, Uganda, and Panama. And basically, since we are the first in the Western Hemisphere, we basically cover the Americas. Of course, uh, the level of engagement with different countries varies. So we're talking about 30 countries in the Americas. and. 422 ranch sites. So we, of course, will not be able to cover every corner, but we are trying to do some model activities that we consider will fly and share lessons into um, wetland management in the, in, the, in the Americas in general. There are also some uh, regional initiatives which are very specific. There is a re regional initiative for Mar del Plata, regional initiative for the Amazon, there is a regional initiative for the Caribbean, and there is a mangrove and coral reef regional initiative that covers a lot of the, of the coastal areas. So there is also, there's another one which is very fascinating that is called the Regional Initiative for Humedales Altoandinos, which is basically for the high uh, uh, altitude uh, wetlands, especially in the Andes. Okay, the purpose of CREO ties in with wise, wise use right away and is to contribute to the wise use and conservation of wetlands in the Western Hemisphere a vital source for human populations and biodiversity through capacity building based on the technical implementation of the Ramsar Convention. So the more we can engage people from different countries, especially in government or civil society, and we create capacity, that's the most we are actually accomplishing our mission. We have several means uh, to work on that, uh, through research, capacity building as such, cooperation, and we are now 15 years. I mean, it was actually began to work in Panama City in 2004, and we have become 15 years. I am actually the third of the directors uh, chosen for CREO. And we have um, a lot of training courses. We do training courses for all of the Americas. Uh, we actually trained a group of people. Those are the, what we call the certified trainers. They come from many of the countries, Mexico, Brazil, Chile, Peru, uh, uh, of course, Panama and um, uh, Colombia, and they, these um, uh, certified trainers are basically certified to do the training on uh, Ramsar guidelines and uh, management. Uh, we also try to do symposia, discussions, and we also uh, introduce a research component. As much as that research leads us to capacity building and to identify lessons learned, and to share with uh, the countries. So now um, I would like to talk a little bit more about uh, the wise use and a couple of cases, knowing that you know we have uh, some limited time. Um, it's very interesting that in 1971, the Ramsar Convention talked about three uh, uh, basic concepts, conservation, management, and wise use of all wetlands, not only the Ramsar sites. That was many years before the Brunelands Report. Now, as we all know, the Brunelands Report created the concept of sustainable development that some of us thought was going to pass away, and then it has turned back you know, after 2015 and become you know, a main you know, a pla a platform for international cooperation. So how do you tie in the wise use many years before with the sustainable development? That has been a matter of discussion for uh, the Ramsar Convention, they even created a task force to try to understand the concept of wise use. And here I give you not like necessarily the definition, but um, there is Max Finlayson who has been doing uh, research on this. 
And I think this is one that actually captures what we want to discuss today. Uh, in this article in 2012, uh, she said, or he said, why is use now defined as the maintenance of their ecological character achieved through the implementation of ecosystem approaches within the context of sustainable development? So basically, in this, this definition fits the why is use within the context of sustainable development, which is a more temporal concept, you know, between the, for the present and the future generations. Now, what is interesting is also how that ecological character changes, and today it's understood mostly in the language of ecosystem services, which, as you know, has become a main, um, a main topic in discussion. So keeping this ecological character of the wetlands means that they will keep uh, their ecosystem services, and that leads uh, into the wise use. And uh, the, it's also very interesting, the ecosystem approach, which sounds very familiar to ecosystem-based adaptation or to uh, the ecosystemic approach that is used by, by IUCN. Now, how to implement this wise use in a very changing environment? Possibly, uh, when they met in Iran uh, back in 1971, uh, they did not foresee how much these issues of conservation were going to be uh, more complex in, in the future. Historically, we all know that wetlands were drained, they were filled, they were diverted, or they were polluted for agricultural expansion or industrial development. However, we have uh, newer threats. Today, we have an emphasis of urbanization. That has become a mainstay of the uh, wetland convention, the issue of cities uh, in wetlands. Also, energy of all sorts, transmission, uh, uh, hydrocarbon, and uh, dams. I mean, the issue of energy is a major topic worldwide that also impacts very, very directly into wetlands. Of course, mining and even tourism. That when I actually began here in Gainesville, we also, we talk about uh, the advantages of sustainable tourism. And I think as time went by, we don't reject tourism, but we know it's not as easy as before when we talk about these model pilot projects back in the nineties. It, tourism does has, has the capacity to, to impact ecosystems in significant ways. And then, of course, climate change, you know, which seems to be like an umbrella for everything that is happening. But in the case of wetlands, it's definitely something that you cannot ignore because they depend on water fluctuations that can be stronger. And if you get fire or other destructive effects, when you have a low, uh, a, basically a low level in a wetland, it may affect the capacity for the wetland to come back. So climate change is a fundamental issue for wetland uh, conservation. Now, the region uh, we are gonna talk about today, it's definitely a fascinating region because it's one of the rainiest in the world, if not the rainiest of the world. I think it's competing between Bangladesh and then this area between Costa Rica and Colombia. So I think most people would say the Colombian Chocó is the rainiest region of the world. But if you take some places in Costa Rica, like Corcovado, possibly some places in Arenal, we also have some data in, in Panama, it, it gets you know, to be very high, very high, like above uh, 10,000 um, uh, yeah, 10, millimeters in a year. That's, that's a lot. So we, this is definitely one of the rainiest, uh, if not the rainiest uh, part of the world. And of course, you're gonna have many weapons. And it's gonna be interesting how do you make priorities if you have water in many places. So the first case I'm going to discuss is about Panama City, which is not officially declared a city of wetlands, but it has all the reasons it should have been declared because uh, in all the accounts about Panama City since its foundation uh, 500 years ago, which is going to be the celebration this year, they talk about Los Pantanos. And you know, all that uh, disease that is coming from the mosquitoes and all that. So uh, when the Spanish established uh, this city in a former indigenous settlement, they knew they were getting uh, basically in the mud, basically. They were getting in the middle of all those marshes and all that. Why they did it? Because they needed to actually cross over to the Pacific and eventually travel to Peru and to Nicaragua. But they, if you look at the accounts uh, during the, the, con the colony, they are continuously complaining about how difficult it was for them to deal with the floods and you know, the marshes and the disease and the mosquitoes 
and everything else. Now, we know that a lot of those wetlands were drained uh, or filled, uh, especially recently, especially about after the construction works. Um, as you many know, uh, the French were not able to complete the Panama Canal. Uh, the main reason was disease. So when the American, uh, Americans took over, a lot of the work was to sanitize uh, the area, and sanitizing meant a lot of using oil to try to avoid you know, the reproduction of mosquitoes, but they drained also. So it's an area that was seriously transformed in the last 150 years. Despite all those transformations, still Panama City holds the largest concentration of migrating shorebirds in the Western Hemisphere. Okay, uh, this kind of shorebirds uh, come mostly from the north, northern plains, and they go all the way to South America, to the southern coast. It's very long migration, and they have about four different routes. Some come from the Pacific, some come from the Missouri area, some come more to the Mississippi, the, the Mississippi, the eastern parts, some the eastern seaboard, and at least uh, three of these major routes converge in Panama. So you get, in a moment, <coughs> Amazing concentration of these shorebirds, literally right next to Panama City. And um, I actually worked before coming to Gainesville for the Panama Audubon Society in '98, and we knew this: no Ramsar site, no special conservation. We just knew that was filled uh, full with uh, shorebirds. Now, because of this situation, eventually they managed to create RS Ramsar Site 1319, which is uh, what they call Panama Bay. And in general, is this uh, polygon that you see there, although uh, part of that polygon was actually declared as a, um, as a protected area. And it's very important to make that distinction. A Ramsar site doesn't have to be a protected area. However, the convention recommends that there are protected areas, especially in the core part of the Ramsar site. So Panama uh, made that decision, which was an amazingly controversial decision. In 2008, uh, let's say five years after the creation of the Ramsar site, we had a technical advisory mission that would say, it is important that the Ramsar site limits include all of the wetlands that are part of the marine and coastal domes, not only swamps and mangroves, but also lagoons and estuaries. The different types of wetlands that confirm the coastal and marine zones are an ecological unit that can be divided in parts. So from the standpoint of wetland science, of conservation, this is the way it should have been. You try to take, tell that to developers, real estate people in Panama City, I would probably be expelled from the country. <laughs> because that would have meant, you know, uh, widening the Ramsar site, possibly towards the ridges, and then, you know, re uh, extending it in the coast. So how do you deal with that? And that's where the concept of wise use can be very helpful. We'll talk more about that. But this actually led to a legal battle, which is that uh, developers actually sued against you know, the existence of this protected area, and the Supreme Court at some point suspended the existence of the protected area. That was a big scandal back then. And then uh, eventually reinstated the protected area. However, there was a realization um, there you have Panama City, and basically the, the shorebird area is right here, and the wetland starts, you know, very close. So um, they realized they had to do something that was more, um, more decisive. So for that reason, um, eventually, um, pass. okay, what am I doing? Yes, okay, this is the close-up. A law, a law was created actually. So it was passed by the National Assembly to give it a higher uh, level of uh, protection. I'll talk more about the law. Uh, yes, I can move this. I'll talk more about the law, but as you can see here, you get uh, part of Panama City, you get where the, the protected area starts. Look at this here. A lot of that is rice fields. However, a lot of that were, were marshes that were drained many years ago, even before urbanization. So if you went solely on an ecosystem approach, that to be included. Now you have another problem, which is all these ridges, which are actually pouring water. Actually, this area that um, is, uh, borders the Ramsar site is one of the most difficult areas for flooding in Panama City. And if it was for the local communities, they would actually support 
the conservation because they have convinced themselves that that will avoid flooding. However, from the developer's perspective, that's not the right way to go. They want to find a different way to, to deal with that situation. The, the, the area stands almost to the Darien province, but this is less under pressure. The area which is really, really complicated is this one next to Panama City. So in 2015, early in this government, uh, the law was passed that protected 39,703 hectares of land surface and 45,900 he uh, hectares of sea surface. However, not long ago this, they began observing this phenomenon they call mangrove diebacks, which is areas in which mangroves are dying. I actually had to go to a telecom this morning very early because there is a group that is uh, interested in trying to figure out what is happening that is happening globally. And in between Panama and Costa Rica, we actually have some people from Costa Rica there, and they are concerned it's actually spreading more. Now, what explains this? It's a very interesting debate, but one of the uh, possible explanations is uh, river intake. Because the, the mangroves are in this uh, area, which is basically in between the salt water and the, and the fresh water. So if there is not the amount of fresh water that you need to keep that balance, then you may have the, the mangroves uh, losing their, their, um, their life. So uh, basically that relation with the upper watersheds is fundamental. And I think that can only be addressed properly through wise use. If you try to extend the protection of the, pro uh, extend limits of the protected area, further up into the hill, that's not going to be very well received. It's very almost impossible to negotiate. However, if there was a wise use of the, uh, of the watershed in which some areas will be preserved in the upper part and the, some river corridors will be preserved, then there is a possibility of keeping the ecological character of a Ramsar site like uh, the Bay of Panama. Now, um, I think ideally that should include this Juan Diaz River watershed but also uh, it should include the archaeological site. Actually, the Ramsar site almost starts where the archaeological site of uh, the first city of Panama um, was found, you know, 500 years ago. So that's a big challenge uh, at this point. An interesting trend of events is that one of the main environmental voices was invited to become, uh, to go into the slate of deputy mayor of Panama City, and they won in 2014. She's uh, going to be the deputy. Well, she's now actually the mayor because uh, the main mayor is actually running for president. So she sort of like has the municipal government uh, under her control, Raisa Banfield. And uh, they began working hard, trying to get advice from some Dutch research centers, also from other universities. And they did some very, very interesting planning on, the, on, the, on the, all these water flows. They actually took our former director from Creo, is actually working for the municipality of Panama, and they came out with this idea of resilient Panama, which is basically a blueprint to try to harmonize uh, urban development with the conservation of the rancher sites. Um, they have you know, different components like rediscovering our wetland city. And here you can see a whole component that is related with the Juan Diaz River Basin, which is actually apparently, or I think almost for sure, going to be financed by the Inter-American Development Bank. So there is, a, there is an interesting proposal. I don't think it's going to be easy by any means, but it's uh, definitely moving forward. So that takes us, this is the case of the Panama Bay Ramsar site. That takes us, you know, to the border area. And to two Ramsar sites, which are back to back. The issue of uh, Ramsar sites in um, transboundary areas is a major topic worldwide. And between Panama and Costa Rica and the Caribbean, we have two Ramsar sites which are back to back. San San Ponsac in the Panama side and Gandoca Manzanillo in the Caribbean side of Costa Rica. Uh, there is a transboundary agreement that was signed in 1995 and is renewed every 10 years. So that means that it's on the third period of renewal. And I had the pleasure to get engaged to work in that. When is that? 1999. <laughs> yeah, they got us into this Talamanca six dollar watershed, tightening the ties of cooperation. I, I like, I like that topic. So yeah, we've been sort of like circling around these you know for a few years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's see. 
<laughs> so uh, besides, you know, the political transboundary agreements, we have uh, binational efforts that have been going through for many years. We have the Mesoamerican Biological Corridor. This is also somewhat Gainesville thinking, you know, like you have met many of the people that were at WCS or many of you, several of you might have been also engaged into this idea of the Paseo Pantera, you know, that basically will be this corridor, you know, throughout the Caribbean, that eventually became politically the Mesoamerican Biological Corridor where all the countries of the region signed. So that's like the official uh, name politically. And out of that process, there were coalitions of NGOs that were formed on the Costa Rican side and on the Panamanian side. IUCN actually facilitated this project a lot, this, this uh, cooperation a lot, but also TNC, Conservation International, many of the, of the NGOs. Um, the Costa Rica, Corredor Biologico Talamanca Caribe in Costa Rica, um, they are fairly well organized. We actually just had a, a visit to the area with them. And Alianza Bocas in Panama is also a very interesting coalition, very multi ethnic very diverse. So there is like the basis, the local basis for conservation in both, both sides of, of the aisle. This is the um, visit we did last, uh, last not two weeks ago, which we were uh, working with Corredor Biologico Talamanca Caribe. Uh, this local NGO and I, we will mention more, has done a very interesting job since the 1970s. And of course, the governments of Costa Rica. This all, all Creo does has to go through the government channels, which is an intergovernmental organization. And here uh, you can see a map. This was the latest. Uh, actually, if I can show well, the, this is the boundary, the Six Aola. Six Aola uh, apparently comes from the Miskito language. That means six are the, the, the snake and then the river. So it's the river of the snake. And you see that it's, it really snakes through. That makes very complicated moving between Panama and Costa Rica somewhat. But yeah, this is the border, and um, this is the site we covered two weeks ago uh, with this uh, coalition of groups. Um, we also had, you know, somebody from the Costa Rica Program of UF presence, uh, Shirley Sanchez. We'll mention her more later. And this is a work we began basically in uh, October. So we basically already covered all this area between October and February, and we are trying to find ways to uh, promote, you know, the wise use and the Ramsar approach in this region. Now, can these transboundary wellness remain viable only as protected areas? I would say not necessarily. You have many problems. You have, this is a large river, the Sixaola goes basically from 3,000 meters above, uh, that's what, 12,000 feet, all the way to the coast in a stretch of less than 100 kilometers, maybe. So you get a lot of sediment moving there. Um, that also has major floods, you know, tremendous floods in that region. Uh, then you have the agricultural pollution because all the coastal plains are, guess what? Banana country. You know, you get these uh, beautiful coastal plains that you would think, you know, would be very nice, you know, for playing fields. But that's, you know, major banana country. It's one of, of the four United Fruit Company sites, Santa Marta, Colombia, uh, this Taramanca, Bocas del Toro, and then um, uh, also... Um, Limon in Costa Rica, they were, where, where the United Fruit Company began its first, you know, like uh, experiences as a global, uh, as a corporation, international corporation. And of course, you have after many years of banana cultivation, pesticides, sediments, solid waste. This is, is a major challenge. Um, then you have the newer threats like hydroelectric dams that change the water regimes. Uh, actually, there was a major mobilization to try to decrease the number of dams because that could uh, affect a lot of the migration of uh, species along the river corridors. Then you have tourism and real estate expansion. If anybody has visited Costa Rica, knows that this stretch is one of the main tourism areas and as well in Panama. So that's a, a major development that is happening there. And of course, uh, Changinola in Panama and also the stretch between Puerto Viejo and Manzanillo are becoming more and more populated. So they are taking uh, the characteristics of more of an urban areas, more than rural areas, and then there are roads that may be built, and then you have the whole issue of water flows, which uh, being for Florida, you are very sensitive and familiar about, you know, how the wellness may be affected about for that. Now, of course, it's a major challenge, but that's what we are trying to partner with other people 
to try to respond to that. Uh, this uh, field trip was, I think, uh, very useful as a first uh, way of start thinking about uh, different measures. Um, the area is fascinating because of the most mosaic of different wetlands. I won't be able to describe it, but besides mangroves that you know about, there are coral reefs. There are uh, also some very, very interesting formations like this here uh, is what they would call a raptor swamp, which is a kind of wetland that exists in the Caribbean. And also there is cativo, which I'm not sure how to say it in, in English, but it's a kind of tree that also forms, you know, some stands and it's almost like a different kind of wetland. So it's, it's really fascinating that the, the variety of uh, wetlands that you find in a very, very small area. Now, how can we address the uh, issues we think that we should reinforce the existing efforts for transboundary collaboration. We have the advantage that the Convenio Transfronterizo is um, valid, and the countries are collaborating, so that becomes a framework. Actually, we have conservation clinic helping us, you know, understand what the different avenues are for that. Yeah, and uh, there are uh, this structure, the Comisión Binacional de Cuenca Río Sixaola. We are actually traveling there next week. You know, to try to uh, strengthen this cooperation. And the coastal corridor, the Caribbean Tourism Coastal Corridor, needs to be understood as one single corridor. There has been uh, so important uh, USAID investment trying to, to, to plan. You know, they have invested in trying to plan. However, after many years, we think there is still not, you know, the kind of uh, integration that needs to happen not between the two sites, uh, Gandoga Masillos and San Ponsac, but actually from Cahuita National Park, which is not part of the Ramsar site, and Bocas del Toro Archipelago. So the two extremes need to be well planned as a tourism corridor that is not going to diminish. Then we are advocating strolling for this approach that is called Rich to Reef, R2R. That's nice. Somebody asked me in Costa Rica, but well, isn't that white waters to blue waters? Well, it sounds very familiar, but <laughs> the issue is to try to understand, you know, this relation between the upper watersheds and the lower watersheds and how that integrates and how you can actually preserve the ecological character of wetlands, you know, uh, across these uh, ecosystems. Uh, this NGO and I, it's a very interesting uh, NGO. They have uh, carried uh, monitoring of uh, a, a river biomonitoring for 15 years, which is very interesting. Now, the, that's the interesting part. The part that is of concern is that they are also worried about what is happening into some of the tributaries of the uh, Gandoka area. Basically. You know, they are seeing changes which are not going in the, the right direction. Of course, you get into the whole discussion, what, what is causing that? Uh, but if you know it's happening, at least you start thinking about it. So very quickly, uh, as CREO, we cannot advocate public policies at the national level. We can't. You no, know, we can give recommendations, we can facilitate, we can share information, However, I am convinced that the Ramsar Convention provides very valuable opportunities for collaboration across different kinds of boundaries. Urban, rural, highlands, lowlands, and of course, the political limits. That's sort of the work we are concentrating between Panama and Costa Rica. And um, the Ramsar Convention has developed these um, handbooks that address different issues like river basin management, uh, international cooperation, uh, also, uh, every three years when they have the conference of the parties, they issue uh, different resolutions that address very particular issues, like uh, this issue of uh, sustainable urbanization, which is a major uh, topic right now. Uh, we think there is a space, uh, this, act this area, these wetlands are also very important for sea turtle conservation. Um, I know also Tom and, you know, in general, the Gainesville Community Caribbean Conservation Corporation, which is Citoro Conservancy now has made historically a major effort to conserve this area. And Ramsar offers, you know, these uh, resolution, you know, and basically how to relate the Ramsar site with uh, turtle conservation. Can do. <laughs> and then, uh, very interesting, also there is this global initiative on peatlands, it's, uh, called the Global Peatlands Initiative. Uh, it's, headed mostly from Europe, from Germany and Sweden, and uh, they have launched this idea of the Caribbean Peatlands Initiative, which is responding to these resolutions of um, Ramsar about peatlands. Interesting, this area also has peatlands. 
and it's it's really it's really fascinating. Uh, in Panama, it's well defined. You hear, you see this here. That's that's a pit deposit. Uh, actually, there was a major interest to get it out and burn it, but you know, after the Ramsar side and after you know all these conservation developments, less likely. And we believe this here in Costa Rica is also pit deposit. But we are we're working on that. Not easy to get inside. <laughs> we are we are working into that because I think that will really put this transnational area also in the under the framework of this interest you know, in global uh, peatland conservation. Now the peatlands are very important because of climate change mitigation. Basically, you know, it's a it's a kind of uh, fossil deposit that you know should not be uh, burned. And uh, in this interest, we basically uh, partner with the University of Florida, thanks to Tom, and we are uh, actually going to be participating in the tropical conservation program uh, in Costa Rica this year. Uh, this is a field trip. You get here uh, Chili Sanchez, who directs the program in Costa Rica for 20 years. Yes. He had the local head of INAE. Uh, we from CREO. We had several people, the uh, Corredor Biologico de la Manca Caribe. So we are uh, basically uh, going to continue working on this. You know, the situation is favorable. And I, I have to talk about Palo Verde. <laughs> I couldn't finish without mentioning Palo Verde. And I also thank that we could visit there Palo Verde with Stefano, with Tom. And we were very happy to, to see all the Palo Verde signs there also. So that's another interesting uh, topic that UF is already working on. And it's going to serve us with information generated and try to put it into uh, usable information for the countries and people interested in conservation. So with that, I finish and thank you a lot. <laughs>